Well, good morning, Believer's Fellowship. We're so glad you chose to worship with us today. If you would, stand to your feet and let's praise the Lord.
And worthy is the Lamb who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was saved. And worthy is the Lamb who conquered the grave. So worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquers the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. He's worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is amazing love. That you would take my place. seated. Amen. All right. Well, good morning and welcome to Believer's Fellowship. Hope everybody is doing well this morning. It's great to see you in the house of the Lord. Kilpatrick King family, it's great to see y'all here this morning. I know we've been praying for you. Welcome back. Welcome back. 
Amen. Well, if this is your first time joining us, there is a welcome card in the seat back in front of you. I'd ask that you fill that out at the end of the service. Uh, I'd love to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. And so uh, in the seat back in front of you, there's two things, actually. There's a uh, welcome card, and then there's like a tithe envelope. Then we're about to tithe the envelope today, unless you want to, unless you feel compelled by God to, to give a tithe offering. But more importantly, there's that welcome card. I'd ask that you fill that out at the end of the service. Again, love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. For those joining us online, uh, you can go to our website, bfchurch.com. Hey, Mr. Sam, what's going on, bud? All right. Uh, you can go to our website, bfchurch.com. And from there, click on the guest tab. On that guest tab, there's a short survey. Just fill out per, uh, pertinent information, and we'll get in contact with you. When you do share your information on your welcome card, please know and understand we are not selling your information. We're not trying to get you a part of some, uh, you know, we're not going to sell you a warranty or tell you, try to get your AT&T bill down lower. It's just so that we have uh, information on you so we can share some information as things come up. At this time, I'm going to ask Ms. Pam to come up, and she's going to read today's scripture. So if you'll stand as we honor the Lord with the reading of his word. Good morning. Today's word is from Philippians 3, 15 through 21. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, as if in anything you have a different attitude. God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that there are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, for which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who transformed the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Father, and we give you all just the, the praise, Father. We do sing our worship to you, Father, not only in times of prosperity, but in times of adversity, Father. We just give you all the praise, Father. We thank you, Father. Father, this morning, Father, we just ask that you just um, remove any of the things in our minds or in our hearts that are not of you this morning, Father. We pray, Father, that you search us out, Father, and through, Father. And again, anything that's not of you, Father, bring it to the forefront so that we can ask for forgiveness of that, Father. Father, I pray this morning that you speak to each and every one of us, Father. Father, this is sacred time, Father. For your word says we're two or more gathered. You are present, Father, and we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for the promises, Father, for those of us that know you, Father, that this life is only temporal, Father, but we have an eternity in heaven with you, Father. But, Father, but we pray for those that don't know you, Father. We pray for a brokenness, Father, so that they can know you, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing. Sweet, the 
Enter your gates with thanksgiving. We enter your courts with praise. Enter into the holy of holies. That's where I want to stay. You break down the walls that divide us and break up our hearts of stone. Give us a heart that rejoices, worshiping you alone. I just want to praise you. I just want to praise you as long as I can with all that I am. I just want to praise
give the praise band another hallelujah. And for all you people that weren't in here to Jort, we'll beat you at the end of the service. <laughs> I know it's fun to fellowship and get caught in the lobby, but don't. We're having church together, amen? So let's enjoy the fellowship together. It's always, there's just this dynamic when we're all worshiping together that you just can't get anywhere else, amen? So I'm glad that you're here to enjoy that dynamic day because I believe the Lord is here and the Lord is present. Now this may look like a strange... Uh, sermon title, uh, unless you listen to the scripture reading, and in the scripture readings in Philippians chapter 3, and which I will encourage you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, and as we're talking about this, 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 this topic called enemies of the cross that the apostle brings up here, and he talks about, you know, there are people, he says, that are enemies of the cross. Now these guys, he, is he, if you follow the whole story here about this, he describes them, these aren't necessarily people out of the church, these are people in the church, all right? Now, if, if you've been in church long at all, and if you've not been in church, you know that there are people who are real possessors, all right? They really walk with God. They love God. And then they're just the professors. They profess it. They've got a good talk, but their talk does not match their walk. These guys aren't walking out in front of the church with signs that says, down with church, down with cross, down with Jesus, all right? They're, they're not parading out front with political signs, you know. It's, it, he just he deals with these people in almost every chapter of the, 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 of the New Testament, whether it's Peter talking or Jude talking or, or Jesus talking, Jesus called them the tear amidst the wheat, you know. It looks like wheat, but it's not real wheat. And he says, you don't have to worry about it. I'll take care of that at the end of time. So we don't have to go weed pulling this morning. But I do want to bring this topic out uh, and, and look at it a little closer because I think there's something here for all of us. And this probably is a little more applicable today even than it was when the Holy Spirit spoke it through the apostle many years ago. Now, I do believe the Word of God is living, which means it still speaks to us today, and we can still hear a word from God today. Amen? So as you look at this passage, he talks about who these enemies of the cross are and what it means to be an enemy of the cross. There it is. You know, if you look into this, you know, uh, Paul starts in, in verses uh, 17, as you look in Philippians 3, where he says, Hey, follow my example, brethren. Uh, Think, I mean, think about that for a moment. He's saying, do what I do. Now, that's a big statement as a Christian to make. It either takes one of two things, somebody who's speaking from humility or somebody speaking from arrogance and egotism and pride. Uh, looking at the Apostle Paul's testimony, the verses before this, it's obvious he's not speaking out of pride because he's already saying at the beginning, he says, I am not perfect. He says, I'm just keeping my eyes on the prize. I'm going to follow Jesus. I want to be what God's called me to be. So I'm heading in the right direction. So follow me. He's not saying that he is perfect. He uses the word, and I believe in the, in the New King James, the King James, and maybe in the New American Standard, where he says, and as many as you are, as are perfect, follow my example. He's not talking about perfect. Hey, you may think you're perfect, but you're not. I hate to tell you that. <laughs> little, little bad news there for you this morning. None of us have arrived. All right? None of us are perfect. He's using it in the context of being mature. I mean, it, how many of you have ever picked up your firstborn child and looked at him and said, oh, this is perfect? Now, it doesn't take long to find out they're not, all right? But hey, you know, the, this child is just perfect, and, you know, it's. But if you come back when he's 17 and he's still wearing diapers and saying, Dad, Dad, you know, then there's an issue going on we need to talk about. So he's not, he's not talking about in age, all right, and in years. He's talking about, he's talking about maturity. And there's people who, who've been in church a long time and never really started maturing in their faith. And as well as people who are just new in the Lord, who sometimes can be more mature than some of those who've been at it for a while. 
So as I talk about this, I, I don't care where you are in your spiritual age or your life. I believe there's a, a real word of instruction. And again, especially within the framework of where we are in our culture today and what's happening all around us, all around the globe. So as he talks to them, he said, listen, I want you guys to realize I'm pressing towards the goal. I, I'm headed for the mark, which is the upward call of, of Christ Jesus on my life. And I want to have an attitude that glorifies God. So you need to have an attitude that glorifies God. He said, but understand, even with that, there are enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, to all of you who truly do have Christ Jesus in your life, you know there's something very phenomenal. and We call it the wondrous cross, the blessed cross, the glorious cross. Now, that to the world is not really comprehensible. I'll explain that in a minute. But to someone who's experienced Jesus Christ in their life, there's just, you, you, when you think about the cross, there's a mixed emotion. There's joy and sadness at the same time, sorrow for what Jesus had to experience, the pain of our sin and our sin being placed upon him. You know, that, that you bring a heaviness, but at the same time a joy to realize that the price for my sin, your sin, our sin, has been paid for and dealt with, all right? I don't have to pay for my sin. If I had to pay for my sin, it'd be death and hell forever, all right? It could never be paid because there's no sacrifice that I could make that'd be acceptable in God's sight because God is perfect, and he accepts sacrifices that are perfect. And, sac and only Jesus met that standard. So the Bible tells us that God so loved you and he loved me that he sent Jesus that perfect one to be the sacrifice for our sin. And we know that verse, for God so loved the world that he gave. That's why the cross to you or to me is, 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 is a wondrous cross. And we sing songs about the glorious cross and the wondrous cross and the blessed cross and all that it means to us. But again, there's this little dividing line between uh, being a professor and a possessor, all right? And my prayer is that we're not just professors of our faith, but we are really possessors of our faith. When Paul talks about these, these people who are, who are you know, anti-cross and enemies of the cross, you know, he's talking about people who don't, don't embrace this mindset of what the cross really means in their life and what, what it really is to, to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And he refers in not just this place but other places and that these people really have an attitude of hostili hostility, whether they know it or not. I mean, you can ask the average person, why don't you go to church? And here's the average answer, uh, too many hypocrites, right? There's just too many hypocrites. And this is literally what he's talking about here. There are people who, who profess it but don't live it and walk it, and, you know. And he said they're a detriment. And literally he's saying these people become enemies of the cross by the life that they're living. In other words, it turns people off. They don't like it. We don't like that. We don't, we don't want to be hypocrites ourselves, I, I would hope. Amen. And the hypocrisy does something that, that cuts against our grain in all of our lives, we just just something about hypocrisy. And, and, and even when we can be hypocrites, we still don't like it in others. I can give an extra amen. I appreciate that. All right. Well, the Apostle Paul said, you know, in 1 Corinthians, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. In other words, if you don't know Christ, then this, 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 this cross message and this word of the cross, it's, it's, it's pretty silly. But he goes on to say in that same passage in 1 Corinthians 1.18, but to the cross to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. So there's this clear indication. So you might not think you're an enemy of the cross, but I, I encourage you to listen to this definition that he gives here because he, he writes it in verse 18. He said, many, there, there are many, I've, I've often told you, and I, I even tell you, he said, I'm crying about it, I'm weeping, that they are enemies of the cross. And then he gives this description about what, who these people are and what's going to happen. But for us, the cross, you know, is the glory of God. It's the grace of God. It's salvation. But there are enemies. And he gives these four descriptions. That, let me give them to you this morning. The first thing he talks about is their destination. He says these enemies of the cross, all right, he said their end is destruction. And by the way, in case you don't know or haven't thought about it recently, there is an end to this story. There's an end to your story. All right. Now it ends here on this physical side, and it begins on the eternal side. But once it ends here, it doesn't mean that it's over. All right. There is an eternal. God made us to be eternal beings, and to 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 have eternal souls. Now, will we have an eternal death that we inherit, called a place called hell, or an eternal life that we place that we call heaven? But the idea here is that the scripture makes it clear the wages of sin is. Death. I mean, there's a penalty that prays for, for death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, so we can't satisfy God. So Jesus comes, satisfies God on our behalf, and we come to Christ, and our lives are changed. It, but truth brings us to that. Truth brings us into to reality. 
But this is interesting. It talks about their destruction. This particular word has to do with an eternal, irrevocable annihilation. At the Magnolia campus, I had Joseph change this when he came in. It said eternal inhalation, but it's not inhalation. It's annihilation. There's this eternal annihilation. Now, it, it goes on and on and on. And you remember the story, perhaps, of Jesus when he's talking about the Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus goes into Abraham's bosom. The rich man goes into hell, and he's begging for a drink of water. He's trying, please send somebody to tell my family not to come here. You know, and you know that story. He has eternal life, but it's really death because ultimately death means to be separated from God for all eternity. That's what death is. It never means annihilation. It never means to cease to be. Now, the Jehovah Witness have a doctrine that kind of goes along that line where they tell us that the, uh, only 144,000 people will be saved, all right? Everybody else, the millions, billions of people who've existed, you know, prior to all that are just going to go and, and no longer exist. It just goes into annihilation, all right? But right now, it's not there. They're kind of being held, I guess, until we pick out the 144,000. That's why I said last time some Jehovah Witness showed up at my door, uh, you know, and I just kind of wanted to hear what they had to say. I, and I was listening to him. I said, you know, <clears throat> of all the things that I could be, the choices of religions and things that are around us in the world today, the last thing I would be is one of you guys. And they said, well, why is that? I said, you know, at least with the other groups, you get a little more hope. <laughs> I said, you, you guys only have 144,000 that are going to make it. And I said, I know my life. I ain't measuring up to what them other guys have done. No way I'm that good. So there's no hope there. And I went to share my testimony, and they quickly dismissed themselves. But it was a moment. But it is eternal. It's, it's, there's no annihilation. There's no just cease to be. It is, we all go on to eternity. And he's saying these people who are enemies of the cross, they really don't know God is what he's saying here. They are pretenders. They are, they are professors, but not necessarily possessors of the faith. And that's their destination. The Bible says in Romans, it gives us this passage in Romans 132. They know the judgment of God, but they that commit such things are worthy of death. They not only do these same things, but have pleasure in them to do them. The word here for death, all right, they're worthy of death. It is a word, apaloa, and I can't even pronounce it in the Greek language, right? But that's close to it. And it's a word in the, in the original language of Scripture that doesn't mean annihilation. It doesn't infer that. It, it's rather, it talks about ruination by separation from the presence of God. In other words, you just will be, you're not going to be in God's presence. You're going to be in a place of eternal separation, eternal ruination. It's just like eternally dying in this other place. In fact, if you look at word opposites in scripture, like we have truth, you know, and, and, and lie, you have, you have light, you have dark. This is the opposite word of, of, of the Greek word for savior. This is the opposite of that. It's, it's either savior, which is life, or ruination for eternity. Savior, which is eternal life, and that's Jesus, our Savior, our Messiah, our Deliverer, or, or it's this other route to go. So it, it, it's very clear that this, if we become this person, if this identifies my lifestyle, just somebody who talks about it, doesn't have a walk, doesn't have a real commitment in their life, then there's not a lot of hope there. And there's all kinds of things that fall into that that we'll talk about in a moment. The second thing he mentions about these enemies of the cross is their, their deity. He says, your God is your belly. Sometimes translations say appetite. I mean, they're not worshiping, you know, their belly. But it's their desires. They put their desires well before God, things of God, God's will, God's way, God's purposes. So what do they want? They, uh, the only thing that they ultimately have in mind is their own physical desires, their appetites. And that could be a lot of things from, from physical desires of moral issues concerned to to materialism, to greed, to covetousness, to immorality, to sensual sins, all that, that is kind of lumped in there together. But Paul's saying, hey, that's what they live for. They don't live for God. They just live for themselves, and all they want to do is satisfy whatever their wants are. It's the old 1960s bumper sticker, but it feels good, do it. That's the mindset of what, what is, was happening there. And Romans, Paul writes to the church in Romans chapter 16, and he, he gives this verse. He said, listen, such men like this, they are slaves. The not of the Lord Jesus Christ, slaves to their own appetites. And by their own smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. So what, what is he saying here? He said, really, if you want to know who your God is, look at how you live your life. You know, look at your behavior. Because your behavior will be the, the demonstration, will be the, uh, the, the, the audio video production of your real beliefs you understand that so what i really believe is what i really live that's that's what what comes out 
In Romans 6, he puts it this way as he's writing the church about it. We've been freed from our sin. We have new lives. He says here, do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as a slave for obedience, that you're a slave to the one whom you obey? In other words, it's either sin, which results in death, or it's going to be obedience to Jesus, which brings eternal life and righteousness. But it's what are you doing with your life? How are you living your life? The, the, that's, that's, that exposes who you really are. I mean, we can say a lot of things, but it's what we do. It's how I'm living and how I'm conducting my life that really shows who I really am. So bottom line here says, who do they worship? They worship whatever their desires are. I mean, whatever the appetites are, that's what I got. That's what I'm going after. Whatever I want, what I get. You know, and it could be an immorality. I mean, God's given us a standard of righteousness regarding immorality. You know, that it's a relationship between a man and a woman in marriage. All right, that's how, when the bed is undefiled, all right? And then he says, then he talks about when it's, when it's, when it's not. He, this is not the right way to live your life. And, and, and then he talks about in the context of, of premarital sex. He talks about in the context of adultery. You shouldn't be living in adultery. Be faithful to the one you're committed to. And he even talks about homosexuality in Scripture, all right? He says, this is wrong. Now, I know, bear with me. I'm not up here to stand as judge. I'm just commenting on what the passage of Scripture has to say. Because I know that when you say these words today, that you are ignorant, you're uneducated, you're uninformed, you're, you're kind of backwards, podunk, whatever it might be. You don't have any level of intelligence because that's what we've been told. But we shouldn't live our life by what we've been told by the world, but what the Word of God says that God has given us a moral standard, all right? And we can violate that and do what, what our desires are. Well, this is just what I want. Well, I may want to slap you in the face, but that doesn't mean I'm right. You may want to slap me in the face. That don't mean you're right, amen, especially. So he, he said, but this, with these folks, it's whatever they want is what they get. And then... If you follow the line of thought here, they will do everything they can to make you think that what they're doing is acceptable. I mean, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit moment, but this, 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 when, when God deals with anybody, he always starts at one place, all right? Jesus said, listen, when I'm gone, I'm going to ascend to heaven with the Father. I'll be back, all right? But while I'm gone, I'm going to send the Spirit, and when the Spirit comes, he will convict you of sin and righteousness. Nobody likes an extra and judgment, all right? See, God's going to talk to you about who you are and how you need to get right with God. He's going to talk to you about your sin. That's a dirty word I know along with the other words I could use today, all right? Not dirty in the church, but dirty in the world. We don't talk about sin. We don't, that's, just, that's offensive. Who are you to judge anybody? I didn't write it, okay? <laughs> I'm not judging anybody. I don't stand here to judge you today. You're not there to judge me today. I'm just here to say, here's what the Bible says. What are we going to do about it? And we make our decisions of what we're going to do about it with it. Now, as I stand there and the Word of God comes, the first thing that God does with all of us, He shows us. This is God's love to show you that you're wrong and that you need a Savior and that you're in sin, that there's a price to pay for sin. And so we have to deal with that. What am I going to Am I a sinner? Well, I just, you know, I, I love myself. Therein lies most of the problem. But you are a sinner. It's your nature. You, the Bible says ever since Adam sinned against God and Adam and Eve chose against God that sin entered into the whole human race and we're all born sinners, all right? There's, there's no getting around that. But when, we, when the Holy Spirit begins to deal with us about that, we have to make a decision, you know? Well, I don't like feeling bad about my sin. Well, then God says, great. I sent my son to die for you to pay for your sin. And you don't have to be bound by your sin. And you don't have to be bound by your lust and by your appetites and your desires. And again, that can just go from moral things to gluttony. It could go to all to the extremes of covetous materialism. I just got to have more, no happiness, and it's just this pursuit. It can go into things like sports even. that It becomes a God. Am I right? Listen, I, I, let me just bound a side note say, it's a whole lot more exciting to put your excitement and pleasure in the things of God than it is most NFL football teams <laughs> or baseball, Major League Baseball. But isn't it amazing how people just get so wrapped up? I, 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 I can't go to church because i got to be at the game. You know, I gotta, or i got to see my TV show so I can't go to church on a Bible study. i gotta, I got to see my TV show. Your TV show is not going to change anything in your life for a better. 
No football game is going to transform you, and I enjoy football, but there's a difference between enjoying something like that and being consumed by something. He said, these people are just consumed by these appetites and by these desires, and, you know, he said, you, and you can find out who really is and what people worship and what's important to them by watching their behavior. The third thing he mentions is, is what they delight in. He uses the word glory in. He says, he says, their glory, the things they delight in, is their shame. In other words, the things that they should be ashamed of, they're bragging about. Does that remind you of anything in the culture today? That's pretty much everything in the culture today. All the things that we should be ashamed culturally, people glory in. They're excited about it. We're going to have pride parades and all these other things. When God says, this is wrong, this will ruin your life, hey, you're a sinner, hey, if, if you're living in adultery, it doesn't matter where it is, all right, if you're not right with God, you shouldn't be delighting and evangelizing in your world. You should repent of those things, get your heart right with God, and uh, no matter what it is, and make your delight not the world, not the things of the world, but your delight becomes in the Lord. Galatians, Paul writes it this way. Uh, May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which this world has been crucified to me and I to the world. In other words, he says, we ought to be excited about the things of God. We ought to be at the things that are going to make a change in people's life. We ought to be enthused and excited and glory and rejoice and things that are, that are going to be transformative to myself and to other people as well. Things which are going to help you, encourage you, change you. Uh, you know, I know what it's like to be in bondage to sin. And when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, there was a lot of junk. It wasn't in the trunk. It was up in the front seat with me. All right? <laughs> I was... And, and before that moment when I really came to grips with God, I'd, I would glory in all this stuff. You know, I delight in my ungodliness. How high you can get, how drunk you can get, how many women you can have, all this other stuff. That's, that's what the world delights in. I can drink him under the table. You know, I've had more women. I've had more guys, whatever it might be. I can make a man do whatever I want to be, all that stuff. Yeah, it's really getting quiet in here. Y'all can at least say amen occasionally, all right? Help Matt, Margaret, would you? <laughs> but now he says, these are the things that have changed. These things are not your delight anymore. In fact, in that passage in Romans 6, where I read from a while ago, he says, these are now the things that you are ashamed of. I'm ashamed of what I used to do. I'm ashamed of what I used to brag about. I'm ashamed of what I used to be proud of. Because God did a work in my heart that just changed me. And now it's not about those things. Romans 1.32 is another passage that kind of gives the lens to this, this same mindset. Where he says, listen, they, there are people who know the judgment of God. They know what the Bible says. They know what God says. But hey, they continue to commit those things. They're worthy of death. Not only do they do those things, those same things, but they have pleasure in them that do them. But yet we have a culture that's constantly using the media... TV industry, music industry, every media outlet possible to desensitize us to what is right and wrong. It's constantly working. In fact, literally, as I said before, if you disagree with what the world says about living together, having multiple partners, having a single partner of the same sex, all that. If, you, if you say that kind of thing, and I'll say it out loud, and we put it on YouTube and everything else, sooner or later they'll cancel us, I'm sure, but until then, keep listening, because if you say stuff that's contrary to anything that the culture's indulging itself in, alcohol or anything, then you're a fool. You know, and you ought to probably be quarantined somewhere, because you're a dangerous threat to the culture. There are people who literally believe that. That Christians are a danger. I mean, we got nations across the world that believe that. You got communist China just down south of us, Cuba. They believe that the church is a threat to the culture. So don't look at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the evidence for these things is everywhere we go. Where well, the world's trying to get us sucked into this idea that to, and to normalize things that are obviously wrong with God. 
I, I, I know we could go on with, with, with illustration, but let me show you a passage of Jude. Jude's a little short letter. We broke it down to verses for explanatory looking things up in study. But in verse 13, really this, this, the fifth or sixth sentence of, of what Jude is saying, he's talking about how in the end times, the last of days, that the church would be filled with a lot of people who would embrace all these different ideas, all right, and would not stand for truth anymore. And it was called apostasy. They, they fall away from the, the faith. And it's not that they were believers. It's that they were, again, they, they were these professors but not possessors of the faith. And he talks about this. He said they're like raging waves of the sea. They foam at their own shame. Wandering stars who reserved is the blackness of darkness forever. So what you need to do when you're cultivating your lifestyle and your philosophy of life is not peer out over the world and say, well, I have this desire, so let me find out somebody that will rationalize what I like. <laughs> and find somebody else, well, so-and-so is doing it, so I can do it. No, all those things that people do to justify. Well, there's a whole group out there that says that, that, that Jesus never said anything about that sin. <laughs> it's very clear what Jesus said about sin and what he said about Sodom and Gomorrah and all those other things that the Jesus used in reference. It's very clear that Jesus believed in the book of Genesis. He preached from it in, more than any other passage in Scripture. So Jesus believed in creation. Jesus believed in marriage. So in, in the traditional marriage, as we understand it. He said, but there are people out there, they just, they're like, they just keep at it and they keep foaming, just like waves keep rolling in, just foaming up. Like, and they're like wandering stars. They're, they're never going to have any direction. There, there's no compass for them. It's what they want. It's their desires. It's whatever they can rationalize in their own heart and mind. And he says, this is especially dangerous within the body of Christ. So let me wrap this up with point four. Their desire. He says, this is the Greek word, uh, uh, apegos, and it means, he says, their mind is on things upon the earth. And if you wonder what that means, Colossians, Paul wrote a little bit clear to Christians. He says, you set your mind, your desires, your affection on things above and not on the earth. In other words, we can delight in a lot of things that are good and absolutely normal that God gives us as blessings of our life. But our greatest pleasure and our greatest delight is to realize that we are not driven and nor do we live by this physical world around us. We are driven by and live for uh, uh, the Lord and for this other world that's coming to us. Amen. He said, but not these people. Their mind is on things down here. And that's all they can think about. What's next? What I can get? What I can have? Who I can have? What I can get away with? And it's just driven by their own selfish appetite and their own selfish desires. He said, they don't mind the things of God. Paul writes to the church in Galatians, and he's dealing with the Galatians because they were having some issues. There were, there were, there were these Gentile believers, and these, these Jewish believers were trying to get him to come in and embrace, you know, uh, you need to follow the, the laws of God and, and follow all these Jewish traditions and things. And, and Paul was saying, no, 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 you know, that you just stick with the truth of God's word. That was for the Jewish folks and the Jewish people. Uh, we've introduced you that you're now, and we've told them, they don't seem to get it, they're free from the law. You know, they're, they don't have to, you, in other words, you don't follow the law to be right with God. You follow Jesus to be right with God. But as I do follow Jesus, I do what it was right. That's how I know I'm following Jesus. He said, so, he said, but the, the Galatians, he says, he said, he said, when we were children, talking about when you first came to Christ, you were in bondage. He said, you were, you were in bondage under the elements of the world, the things of the earth. And, that, and I look at my life and I say, yeah, when I first came to Christ, I was a mess. I'm, yeah, it's Kathy. I'm probably still a mess, all right? But I was a real mess. And there was a lot of junk that was holding on to that I had bad habits, you know, bad, bad philosophy of living life in general just had been all directed in the wrong direction. And so God starts breaking all this stuff off of me. And the more I walk with Jesus, the more he breaks off of us, right? Same with you. The more you walk with Christ, the more the junk comes off your life. And this is what he tells the Galatians. He says, hey, you used to be into those things. But he said in verse 9, he says, but now after you've known God, or rather known of God, how are you turning back again to those weak, beggarly elements, you know, these things of the world? Where until you, do you, do you want to be in bondage again? That's a good question. Do you want to go back to bondage? In verse 11 of Galatians 4, he said, I'm, I'm kind of afraid for you guys, lest I bestowed upon you a labor in vain. In other words, are you guys listening to what I'm telling you? <laughs> are you really? As, as a pastor, or if you're a disciple of, of people, you know exactly what I mean. You poured a lot of stuff into people, and they don't seem to be doing anything with it. And Paul said, I'm kind of afraid I'm just wasting some time on you guys. That's, that's a powerful statement, amen? 
So he said, you don't turn back to that. Okay, the simplest terms. The devil hadn't got anything for you once you've come to Christ. But more trouble. Do you think you had trouble before you came to Christ? You start following Jesus, you just turn back one little bit. He'll suck you in like a vacuum. That's why he says you keep your mind on other things. You keep your mind on the things of God. Don't be, don't be drawn in. I mean, every temptation really begins with our thoughts, right? That's why the Bible says you bring your thoughts into captivity of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the good news. He's writing to them. He says, this is the enemies of the cross. And he, and he talks about their destination, their, who they worship, their deity, what they delight in, and their desire. It not got anything to do with God or heaven. But he says, but you, on the other hand, and this is found in verse 20 and 21 we read, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly we wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus will transform the body of our state, our humble state, into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject everything to himself. He's talking about this mighty Jesus going to step on the scene and transform us in the day's ahead. Let me put it this way. We also have a destination as children of God. I am sure and I'm settled and I'm 100% that my destination is, is taken care of because I trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you that where I am you might be also. So I know that if in the days, weeks, months or ahead, or hopefully years, but if I close my eyes in death, the next second I will open them up in glory. Every one of us in this room have lost people we love, right? But if they were children of God, if there was a profession, a genuine profession, possession of Jesus in their heart, the moment they closed their eyes, and no matter what that kind of incident was in their life, accident, malady, COVID, whatever, the moment their eyes were closed, the next second opened, the Bible says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. They are in the eternal presence of God. Just go to the book of Revelation 20, 21, 22, right in there. In the book of Revelation, it gives a description of what heaven's like. I mean, it's a very avid, very clear description. Uh, John the Apostle has been caught up into heaven. God's spoken these words to him. He's witnessed these things. and It's, it's incredible. Make, I mean, just add to the fact that there's no presence whatsoever of the things wherein we were ashamed of. There's no presence of guilt. There's no presence of doubt. There's no presence of fear. There's no presence of sin. Just the eternal bliss, glory of God. I mean, you're not sitting on a cloud strumming a harp if you understand heaven, all right? You're just walking into everything that is purpose and everything that's significant and everything that's truly meaningful. The eternal things are all present now. You have comprehension like you've never had before. I don't think anybody's at the, the heaven's door saying, I'd like to go back for another year. As much as we might want them back for a year, they ain't coming. If it's left up to them, they ain't coming. <laughs> but we will see them again. Now, should I not die physically, and put it this way, should the Lord return before I physically die, the Bible tells us in the moment instance that, you know, that the dead in Christ will be raised first. Those in the tombs and cemeteries and crypts, wherever it might be, they're going to come out of the grave, and it says, then we which are alive. So what's going to happen? Jesus is going to come back with all the saints of old who have passed on and are in his presence, all right? All those folks you love, all the people we care about, all the ones we miss so dearly, they're there with the Lord, all right? They're not in some kind of eternal state of, of, of slumber, all right? They're going to come back with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and when they do, the Bible says they're God, God's going to bring their bodies up and he's going to make those bodies that have obviously seen corruption and decay. He's going to do the supernatural incredible instantaneous moment of glorifying those bodies which means they're going to be completely reestablished and even made better than they were Amen. glorious bodies and their soul will be united with their body in the air and it says as that's happening we which are alive and remain at that time we will be caught up to be with the lord as well what a moment you say brother joe you believe that that sounds like just craziness i believe every bit of it and i'm looking forward to all the craziness all right <laughs> And I'm glad to say I believe I get to participate. So if I'm coming with him or coming up to him, hey, didn't make any, I'll take either either way. Amen. Either way is fine. But that's, that's my destination. That's what I'm excited about. That's what I want to carry on about. But why, why is that my destination? Because of my deity. God's Jesus. He said we're, we wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to change these vile bodies. He's going to transform us to the, to, from this humble estate into conformity with his body. What body? The one that Jesus had when he came up out of the grave, when he rose from the dead. 
God had raised him up with this glorified body. In fact, it was so unique a body, he could walk through walls. He just came right into the room where the disciples were. All right? He could be in Galilee the next minute and say, when y'all get there, look me up. You know? And when they got there, you know, he's on the shore fixing lunch. And he eats with them. So it's a body that eats. It's a body that moves like, like light. It's supernatural. It's incredible. It's glorious. That's my destination. And it's my destination because he is my Lord and he's my God. That's why I'm excited about it. That's why if I'm going to delight in something or glory in something, I'm going to glory in, in, in what awaits me and what God's doing in my life now. Not all I can get away with. Not how much sin I can press on to and, and be outdo somebody else in that sin. All right? Not glory in it, parade in it, but be ashamed of what it was. But now I have this new delight. It's not like I just walked in and now I just don't get to do everything they get to do. I'm just miserable. No, I get to do so much more than I ever did before. Amen. The simplest terms I can put it, the devil never treated me this good. Amen. Never. He never paid off. He always lied. And if he did pay off, it was always counterfeit. It wasn't a real deal. It was, it was pretend happiness. It was, it was pretend joy. It was a pretend peace, which I either had to drink it, smoke it, snort it, you know, to get it or go to sleep. <laughs> That's where the peace came from. But when I came to Christ, man, why do I get excited about Jesus? Because I love him, because he's my Lord, because he changed my life, and because where he's taking me on the glory. So that's my desire is heavenly. My desire, and yes, there's things I desire on the earth. I desire fellowship with friends and family. I, 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 I love you. Believe that? I do. I love you. I love our church. I love our fellowship. All right? Are we perfect? Lord knows we could sit around and point each other's imperfections out all day, but that is such a waste of time. All right? Because you can't do anything about it anyway. I can't change you. You can't change me. But we can let God change us. And that's what he's saying here. And when our delight becomes that, and that becomes our deity, and that becomes a realization of our destination, and that all cooks in the brain for a little bit, then our desire becomes for the things of God. I want to be like Christ. I want to, be, I want to experience what God has for, for my life to the fullest degree. I, want to, I don't want to try to chisel away at what God's will is in my life and find it and shape it till it fits what I want. I just want to find out what it is and dive in. Let's go. Let's, let's get it done. Because God's up to something bigger than all of us. You know, I, I was talking to the guys, and we had a prayer meeting this morning with some of the men, and I, I was just telling them, listen, and they were complaining about some different things, and one guy was saying, my blood pressure is high, and the guy was talking about his back hurting. You know, I said, hey, you know, God's going to take all that off for you one day. You have to realize that the only reason you're still here, aches and pains and all, is because ultimately, as this passage says, our citizenship is in heaven. We are just passing through. Yes, I have a U.S. passport. And I have, praise God, a Texas birth certificate. <laughs> but mostly I, I have a citizenship in heaven. And when they take this body, should the Lord delay his coming, and put it in a box, they might as well throw my passport. It's no good. Throw it in there with me. But I have another passport. It's the cross of Jesus Christ that we glory in, and that's what we boast in, and that's what our glory is, and that's what we should do in rejoicing. Let me read these last words to you. 1 Corinthians 1, 17, Christ sent me not to baptize, but God sent me to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be none effect. It's not about trying to convince you with words. It said, for the preaching of the cross, though, is to those that perish, it's just foolishness. But to those who are saved, the cross is the power of God and the salvation. That's the glory of it. Folks, everybody in this room, lest you think I'm sitting here trying to judge homosexuals or adulterers or whatever else or drunkards or whatever, I'm not the judge and neither are you. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. But praise God, there is a Savior. There's a Savior who loves you, who can bring purpose and significance and meaning to your life who can seem to take all the chaos you go through and just bring it into simplicity and give you peace about what's going on in your life. A way has been made, and the cross points the way, and that way is salvation through Jesus Christ. But a decision, a decision has to follow. A decision on your part has to be made. A decision to say, I will follow Jesus Christ, and the cross of Jesus Christ is not foolishness to me, but the cross of Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God 
and is the way that God has provided for me to experience eternal life. So let me just ask you to review your own heart. What is your destination? What is your, or who is your deity? What do you delight in? What do you really desire? That exposes where we are and who we are. Maybe as a Christian who's not maturing and going on, you know, you've, you've been kind of stuck in the same place. Pray for God to restore passion. And to do that, you begin to move your delight to a different area. It's not this world. There's a lot of things I can delight in this world that I enjoy doing. All right? But my greatest delight, which stays premier above all things, and I would substitute every other desire I have for that, for that one desire, to be with Jesus in glory. I love hunting. I love golf. I love fishing. I love being my wife. But the greatest desire of all is going to be the, should be satisfied and found in being with God throughout all eternity. Amen? Amen. If, that, if that doesn't fit the mold of your heart and life, you can do two things. You can push the Bible aside and say, I'm not interested. Or you can say, hey, I think I'll take the truth. I'll embrace that new life. Amen? Amen. But it's your call. And you will be responsible for whatever your decision is. I mean, we're all going to stand before God. And I'm not going to say, oh, God, Pastor Joe had preached that a little clearer. I'd have got it. <laughs> or my mama hadn't been such a, you know, uh, hard on me. Or my daddy had not abandoned me. Or my, my, whatever it might be, we all use excuses for it. I had a bunch of them. Amen. But let's move to the cross of Jesus Christ and say, that's where I'll find life. Let's stand with our heads bowed. As we close this service, I'd ask you, the Bible says this, and I'll, I'd ask you the same thing. The Bible says, let's examine our hearts to see if we are in, in the faith, that we do know Jesus Christ. And I'd ask you to do that yourself. Just examine your heart. Do you really know that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Make that decision today. Trust the Lord today. Father, we know that you're in our midst. We just sense your presence here today. I thank you, Lord, for your presence here today. But we, want, we don't want to take that for granted. If you're saying something to us, individually, corporately, God, may we have the ears to hear. May we have the eyes to see what it is you're saying to us. God, I pray that somehow you just strip away all our, our flimsy excuses and get us to the place of reality. I pray for those who perhaps don't know you today, Father, that today would be a day of change for them. I pray for those that do know you who've been minding the earthly things. Lord, more interested in what this world has to offer them what you have to offer. You'd bring them back to a, a place of, of, of recommitment to their, of their heart to you. Father, there's some folks struggling with this issue today and it's maybe about doubting and not knowing for sure. I pray they find the time to really focus on you so that you can bring the confirmation to their heart that they need. But Lord, whatever you're saying to us, may we have an openness to do what you've called us to do. And with our heads still just bowed for a moment, we, we give an invitation that means if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ and you would like to make him your personal Lord and Savior, it's a choice that you need to make. It starts right there with opening your heart and your life for Jesus Christ and letting him come in. Even right there, you can say, Lord, please forgive me my sins. He'll do that because it's all been taken care of at the cross. But give your heart to Jesus today. Don't put this off. Don't hesitate. You know what you need to do. Maybe you're a Christian. You say, I've got some things that just aren't... I would encourage you to come and find a place at this altar today and just kneel between you and Jesus and, you know, turn it back over to him. Get it right with God. Maybe there's some other need that's real pressing in your life. You just need to come and pray with, between you and God. Feel free to do that. But if you don't know Jesus personally, as your Lord, and say, please come to me or Pastor Gary standing here and say, listen, I want to get my life to Jesus today. Let us pray with you, rejoice with you about your decision to begin a brand new life. It starts in your heart. The Bible says we should confess it with our mouth once we believe in our heart. Maybe you're looking for a church where the truth is preached unapologetically. People love God and love each other. I encourage you to come be a part of Believer's Fellowship. The only prerequisite is to be a part of Jesus first. Give your life to Christ first. And come join what God's doing with our fellowship. So let's be open to the Lord. We're going to sing this song of worship and praise as we sing, as we pray. You come.
do as the Lord has led you to do today. Step out now. Come, we'll meet you here. just for a moment longer. Let me just, as the music continues to play, you can continue here. But, you know, when the Lord speaks to us, it's an important thing. You've heard me use the illustration before. It's a biblical illustration. It says that the Word of God is like seeds that are sown in the field. And the seeds of the Word, and the fields are our hearts. And that if we're not careful, that the fowls of the air will come and steal the seed. And then later Jesus explained that, saying that's when Satan comes and tries to keep you from really hearing but I would encourage you, whenever you hear truth, whenever you read truth, whenever you hear a message, that whatever the Lord said to you from that, that you would just take a moment and say, Lord, I receive this, and I really want to walk in this. I just want to encourage you today. That sin is a really heavy load to bear. It is, David the psalmist said, Lord, this is so heavy, it's over my head, I can't, I can't deal with it. I can't bear it any longer. The greatest moment in my life is the first day I finally rolled that over and let God wash that and take that and cleanse it. The greatest day ever since has been when something's come up in my heart and life that wasn't right with God was to get that weight off, to get my heart right with God. And I think sometimes we feel like God's mad at us or God's not going to forgive us or we've done too much. No, that's not God. He's a God of mercy and grace, ready, stands ready that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to make us clean from all unrighteousness. Man, what a great God of mercy. Amen. We have this time of mercy in our world right now where we can receive mercy. And to be the bearer of bad news is just simply to say there's a day that coming that mercy is going to be stopped. But today, when you hear his voice, respond to what he's saying to you. Receive God's mercy. Let him, let God, if you say, well, I'm just not sure I understand, ask him. Ask him. He will explain it. He'll just, he'll lead you to the answers. He's faithful. He wants you to know the answers. He's not playing cat and mouse with your life. 
He loves you. Amen. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for truth. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us truth and your word like a, like a light unto our path, a lamp unto our feet. We bless you for that and thank you for it. May you be glorified in what we've done in this building today. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Brother Gary's got a few announcements for us. And uh, until then, just remember Brother Joe loves you. <laughs> Amen. A couple of closing announcements. We are having our new lift study to, today. So our morning group already met. We'll have our evening lift tonight. Um, it is why I believe. And so if you're not in a lift group, it's a great opportunity to get in at the ground level. We started first lesson today. And so I think our evening groups start at 530. So you don't want to miss that. That's here at the church. Um, don't forget our Sunday evening activities, Awana is youth. They start at 515. Lift starts at 530. Now, with our kids, our Awana's program, um, if you see an Awana's kid, ask them to recite their memory verse. Let's see where they are. They do that every week for Awana's bucks and, and, and things like that as they progress through the Awana uh, program. But more importantly, it's to store those verses in their heart. Because, you know, First Peter talks about how we should always be ready to give an account and a defense uh, of, of our beliefs and why we believe in our faith. And so this is what happens. They store these verses in their heart. So when that time comes, they have that understanding and that foundation on their faith. Don't forget, there is no Wednesday night services this Wednesday. No Wednesday night services this Wednesday. That's youth, that's kids, and that's um, Wednesday night service. So don't come to church this Wednesday. You'll be by yourselves. Um, Start praying for our marriage retreat. That starts Thursday. Amen, Miss Margaret. That's right, Thursday. Um, be in prayer for those couples that will be going, for the pastors that will be sharing that word. It starts Thursday night at 8. Uh, I pray for travel mercies for those that are going and coming back. If you're not going, just be lifting them up uh, as they go and, and, and hear God's word regarding that. It is not too late to sign up, though. We do have uh, room available, rooms available for that. Uh, so if you need, if you want to go, it's not too late. Let me or Pastor Joe know, and we'll get you in. Um, and then our Journey 101, which is our introductory class, uh, what, you know, it, it goes back to the history of Believers Fellowship, what we believe, what it means to be a member. It's our membership class. So if you have not attended 101, it is October 17th at 3 o'clock. You can sign up. Out There's some forms out there in the back, or and, and we can guide you to that so you can sign up. Uh, Gary Staley Memorial Golf Tournament is um, October 16th. Uh, now, Don and Ruby Staley are members over at Magnolia Campus. They do this in honor of their son who passed away uh, as a firefighter. And so this is just a great event. It does give provide scholarships for, for men and women that want to become uh, firefighters. And so this is just a great uh, tournament and a, and a great cause. So for more information, you can definitely visit that website that's on the um, the uh, PowerPoint slide there. Um, don't forget to stay connected through uh, through Facebook, online, through our website, bfchurch.com, uh, for more information regarding our church. Uh, finally, for our guests and online viewers, uh, don't forget that I talk about I spoke about the uh, welcome card at the at the beginning of the service. If you would fill that out, and at, and at the end, I'll be out here in our welcome center to give you and hand you a free gift, uh, just so I can get to know you, shake your hand, and, and thank you for coming this morning. Don't forget your tithes and offerings. That's the second thing that is in the seat back in front of you is that well, that uh, tithe card or tithe envelope. Three ways to give. We don't pass a plate here at Believers Fellowship. You can use that tithe envelope. You can also go through PayPal through our bfchurch.com. You can give that way. Or you can drop your tithe check off or tithe and offering check in person Monday through Thursday, um, uh, 9 to 5. Finally, uh, we do have our food pantry. Uh, um, Distribution. So if you want to get more information on that, you can see the ladies in the back. Uh, that is, we also have our, our food uh, clothing pantry coming up, which will give more information uh, in, in the days and weeks to come. With that being said, where are we? go to the kitchen. Okay, there are food items in the kitchen for the food pantry if you want to take something home. Uh, with that being said, you are dismissed.